confused ideas of salvation. Can we not understand that the most costly thing in the world is sin? It is at the expense of purity of conscience, at the cost of losing the favor of God and separating the soul from him, and at last losing heaven. The sin of grieving the Holy Spirit of God and walking contrary to him has cost many a one the loss of his soul. Who can measure the responsibilities of the influence of every human agent whom our Redeemer has purchased at the sacrifice of his own life? What a scene will be presented when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened to testify the salvation or the loss of all souls. It will require the unerring decision of one who has lived in humanity, loved humanity, given his life for humanity, to make the final appropriation of the rewards to the loyal righteous and the punishment of the disobedient and disloyal and unrighteous. The Son of God is entrusted with the complete measurement of every individual's action and responsibility. To those who have been partakers of other men's sins and have acted against God's decision, it will be a most awfully solemn scene. The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The law of God has been largely dwelled upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. I have been shown that many have been kept from the faith because of the mixed, confused ideas of salvation because the ministers have worked in a wrong manner to reach hearts. The point that has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I have wondered that this matter was not made the subject of discourses in our churches throughout the land when the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me, and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk that I have given to the people. In examining my writings, 15 and 20 years old, I find that they present the matter in this same light, that those who enter upon the solemn, sacred work of the ministry should first be given a preparation and lessons upon the teachings of Christ and the apostles in living principles of practical godliness. They are to be educated in regard to what constitutes earnest, living faith. 